Uh, we're going to go to some scripture, which is traditional scripture, but I hope that you came this morning thinking about the road to Easter, and as David has been talking about a variety of different things, I said, what do you want me to preach on? He said, it is Palm Sunday. Uh, I want us to look at that scripture and think about it as if this makes a difference with where you are in your life, in the situations that you find yourself in, and in that very special heart place. Where are you with God? And let's go into the Scripture thinking that our Christ is coming to town. From Luke 19. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Now they must have been close. I have been on this road. It is narrow. It twists a little bit, and it descends. And yet somehow, his distractors were close enough to get into his ear. And they say to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I think that's why that many of us in Christian faith and I think even in other faiths, sometimes have an interesting little feeling that comes up inside when we see, even today, pictures of the Wailing Wall. It cries out. I think when we look into nature, it cries out. I started preaching when we barely had microphones. <laughs> And we didn't have air conditioning, and I swallowed a fly too along the way. Windows were open, and everything else went on. The dogs would bark and wander in the house. But you know, all those things have changed. And the one thing that I like the best is I love those magnificent pictures of nature that go behind our words. They just have that feel of the Creator God that comes in and touches us every time they're on there, regardless of what the words are saying. It's as if the world is saying, God is really there. And then what happens this week? But scientists give us pictures of a black hole. Now, I haven't been that close to one. And I've never seen a picture of one before. But when I looked at that thing, the immediate thing of thought was, we've often been afraid of that thing. But it's a part of God's creation. And they tell us that it is so dense that nothing can ever get out of it. That's why it's a kind of black hole you can't see in there. What if You took that as a metaphor of God holding His people and never losing them. That they were wrapped up inside of Him. And there is behind that blackness a world that is so amazing that you and I can't even grasp it. The rocks cry out. What happens if we decide to add our voices to that? 
that if we would go along with the God. Now they added their voices. For 400 years, history tells us that God had not spoken in Israel. I don't know about you, but I haven't been alive that long. Sometimes I think, but I'm not there. But for 400 years, they felt as if we have been deserted. Where is God? And now, there comes a man into town who has healed the sick, who has fed the hungry, who has been there for marginalized people, who has forgiven sin and changed lives that were this trash. They give meaning to people who had no jobs of worth or self-worth. This was the Christ who was going to change everything. It was worth the praise. This was the Christ that their hopes rested on. This was the day, the week, when God was going to change everything. And they were willing to stand in line and follow Christ and throw their cloaks and raise their hands and shout with all their voices. And boy, during that week, if you read the Scripture, Jesus didn't disappoint. He confronted the self-righteous. Boy, isn't there somebody in your life who's self-righteous you'd like to get them, huh? Jesus did. He got them. He taught some common sense truths. Every now and then, I see a law or two passed, and somebody says something, and I said, they had no common sense to that. And Jesus Christ cuts through all that. And he reminded them of their heritage. My wife finally got me to do my DNA, so I hate to tell you guys, but I'm a Viking. <laughs> and so, and I don't know what that says, but you know what? It's my heritage. Well, I have another heritage. I'm a Christian. And he reminded them of who they were, God's people. He honored the gifts of the poorest. Remember when the two little pennies or half pennies went in the offering? What God honors that? We honor the big things, not the little things. But he honors the heart. He called sinners to holiness. Palm Sunday and this week is all about God confronting the false hopes of the world. The places you and I like to put our hope, place our hope. I think it's the key moment when God penetrates our spirit and redefines faith as a relationship, a circumstance. It's the Creator saying He is with us in our suffering, so much so that he will not strike back when we are at our worst. And folks, you and I all know we've had our worst. What another? We have harmed self. And yet God does not strike back. You know, I cannot begin to understand the thing about Jesus Christ. And about him dying on the cross. I preach sermon after sermon after sermon. But all I know is every time I see Christ on the cross and God not striking us, I have to say, I want that God. Don't understand it. I can't rationalize it. But I want that God. God. My other hopes, down the tubes. God loving me is the truth I want. When I have failed, when I sin, when I have lied, I want to know God's not going to leave me there. I don't want him to wipe the slate so I get to start over doing the same thing tomorrow. I want to know he loves me enough to give me the power to change. 
that's the beginning of this week. I need Palm Sunday to remind me that much that passes for hope is no hope. I need it to remind me that God once and forever broke into our lives with a different understanding. Holy Week is about hope beyond anything we dream of. It's about having a relationship with God. If you're in a place in your life right now, I do not mean to like make light of your situation or your circumstance, but God knew that until we die to our earthly hopes, that you and I are not going to have the personal healing we need in order to have a true hope. Our hope is that God will love us in an amazing way. Hebrews 7.18 says, The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, meaning the law, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope was introduced by which we draw near to God. That former regulation is the thing that each of us have. And if I do right, if I push all the right buttons, then good things are going to happen. Let me tell you a little secret about life. You can push every good button you know and things are still going to happen that you're not going to like. Because we live in sin. And unfortunately, I have to live with you. And you have to live with me. And that's where things go wrong. And for all of the religious systems that man has tried to put together, we have never found one that solved that issue. And that's why Jesus is on the cross. Because there is no circumstantial change. There needs to be a relational change. One's desire to live our lives better never really changes us. The desire to pay penance and sacrifice never really changes us. I think the older I get, it's this. If you can for a moment see Christ on the cross through the eyes of God, and not desire to strike the people who put him there. You might understand the love he has for you. And that changes us. That's simple. That changes us. Palm Sunday confronts our nature. I have some little kids in here today, so that is really good. Several years ago, I was doing a wedding in the other building, and uh, the, the rehearsal uh, came first, and it was over, and I come out into the narthex outside the sanctuary over there, and there's this cute little five-year-old girl. Everybody knows five-year-old girls are cute, right? Raise your hand. Okay. Really? <laughs> this one was on her back, kicking and screaming at her mother. And spitting at her. It's one of those where a parent who is not the parent of that child is so glad that we raised our children right. <laughs> and it is so horrifying if you're the mother who's trying to get control of that thing that resembles nothing like a five-year-old child. Well, I was younger then. I still try this. And I love to torment kids. And so it was my turn. So I kneel down and get in this little girl's face. And I said, after she had said to her mother, You make me so mad! I said, Honey, no one can make you mad. That's your choice. And she shot back, she can. 
That's never left my head. And it hasn't left my head for this reason. At five year old, she had a philosophy of life. If anything bad happens to me, it's your fault. It's not my fault. It's your fault. Anybody in the room like that? No, don't raise your hand. We would be forever having confession. Isn't it what we do? Isn't that the way we are? That poor little girl. I wonder where she is today. There is good news about Palm Sunday. God works on our nature. And if you haven't had enough circumstances to find that out, guess what? Tomorrow's another day. And he will work on your nature because he is interested in your inner being, your soul. God broke his silence on Palm Sunday, and the people remembered Malachi 4.2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healings in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. The good news is that we were lost, but now we are found. Dwayne Huffman's wife, Jackie, passed away this past week and married for many, many years, and he raises cattle, and this is the calving time of the year. And last week, I talked with him. He had 40 calves get out of one of the fields he had. You know what that means. And he had such an interesting approach to that. He said, all those calves were out there, and they were frolicking. You all know what that means. They were frolicking. They were leaping. They were running. They were playing. And all I could think is, this is a man who was able to use those words on the death of his wife, after 11 horrible years of cancer. But you think, as difficult as our situations are, that God doesn't want that for us? You know what faith is? It's believing that and not living in it. And that's where we are. Our task, out of, good, uh, out of Palm Sunday, is to become conscious of God. From this place, God took Jesus and his disciples to Passover. And what the Passover was, it was a remembrance of coming out of Egypt years ago when they were slaves. And if you go back and look at that story, to get them out, Pharaoh controlled them, and Moses had to say, let my people go. Remember that? And then there was a plague. If you look at the plagues, each one of the plagues dealt with one of the gods of Egypt. In other words, God was besting the false hopes of the Egyptians. Jesus had to die to best our false hopes. Because our false hopes are not in the circumstances we face, but the relationship God desires for us. Every Jewish boy, 13 or older, knew the meaning of that Passover meal. They knew that that last plague was the death of the oldest child. Because for the Egyptians, guess what? The future was in the children. Who died on the cross? God's only child. Our hopes can't even be in child. Our hopes must be in our God. It is God who holds everything. 
And that plague did not come just on the Egyptians, but it came on the land. And sin still comes on the land. But the families who chose to take the sacrifice and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the angel of death passed over. God in Christ has said, I will pass over those who accept my son's suffering and death and give you life and free you. Jane uh, recently schooled me on another Jewish tradition, Bar Mitzvah. She had heard some teaching and shared it with me. And we often in the Protestant tradition consider the Bar Mitzvah simply a coming of age of the Jewish child. And they have to know certain things. And then they're considered able to be more of an adult. But this particular teacher or scholar said there's another aspect to the Bar Mitzvah, and that is the father is now no longer responsible for the child. Folks, when Jesus died on that cross, he said, It ain't your mama's faith anymore, it's yours. I have given you hundreds of years of revelation to make it clear that you can't be a five-year-old laying on the floor yelling at your God when things go bad. It's your life. And is there in you something that turns an eye toward the cross and as Jesus Christ suffered there for a moment you can grasp that weight of the Father and not strike back. That's love. I want to close by a comment that uh, when I was in Georgia, we had a great ministry team that did tremendous drama. And one of our greatest dramas was two or three nights we did uh, at Easter, we did Christ's uh, a, a drama where Christ died on the cross. And they actually put Christ on the cross and they had all kinds of things. They, Put him on the cross and they actually wired this guy up and with the smoke and stuff he could they took him down off and they came out uh, uh, oh is this is this wonderful but i had a visiting pastor there and he came up to me after the thing was over and he said i loved everything about your presentation but this and i said yeah he said you left him on the cross too long And it stayed with me. How long does Christ have to stay on the cross before you take him in your heart? Let us pray. Father, forgive us when we do not understand. Protect us, Father. When we are blasphemous in so many ways. Allow us, Father, when choice is before us, not to seek remorse as Judas did, but seek repentance as Peter did. And in that repentance, Allow us to hear your words to Peter. Do you love me? Let them penetrate our hearts till we can say, yes, Lord, we love you. Amen.